December 12, 1985, Puyallup, Washington. 36-year-old Mike Reamer and his 21-year-old girlfriend Diana Robertson take their two-year-old daughter Crystal out for a day in the woods to get a Christmas tree. That afternoon, Crystal is found wandering alone outside a Kmart, but is unable to tell anyone where her parents are. Two months later, Diane is found murdered outside Mike's truck on a remote logging road, but Mike himself has gone missing. Police begin to suspect that Mike killed Diana and was also responsible for the murders of another couple in the area months earlier. In 2011, a skull fragment belonging to Mike is found a mile away from where Diana was killed, but the circumstances of their deaths remain unknown. After that, the trail went cold. Hello everyone and welcome to our latest episode of The Trail Went Cold. I'm your host Robin Warder and you've probably already heard this wonderful piece of news which started off 2017. Unsolved Mysteries is back. For the past several years, Unsolved Mysteries has been virtually impossible to view online, but its digital distribution rights were recently acquired by a company named FilmRise. At the time of this recording, they released the first two seasons for viewing on Amazon Prime, and the rest of the seasons will be here eventually. It is truly a joyous occasion, and what better way to celebrate than by doing a podcast episode about another Unsolved Mysteries case. The story I'm covering today is one of my personal favorite segments from the show, but since it was an exclusive summertime special which aired in September of 1989, between seasons 1 and 2, it is yet to see the day on Amazon Prime. But I think it's one of their more memorable and complex mysteries because of the ambiguous nature of the crime. It involves the 1985 disappearance and deaths of a couple named Mike Reamer and Diana Robertson. What's so interesting about this case is that Mike was not confirmed to be dead for over 25 years, and it was unclear if he was a victim or if he actually murdered Diana himself. And another complication is that the couple's two-year-old daughter survived, and she was likely present when the crime took place, but was too young to shed any light on what actually happened. But we'll delve into all this momentarily. Anyway, I previously featured this case on an article I wrote for listverse.com titled The 10 Unsolved Cases Involving Murdered Couples, which was originally published in July of 2013. But before we get started, just a brief reminder that The Trail Went Cold is a weekly podcast which alternates between our regular full-length episodes and 15-20 to 20 minute minisodes. We deliver either a new full-length episode or a new minisode every Wednesday. We're currently available for download on several platforms including iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play Music, so if you like this podcast, be sure to subscribe to it. The Trail Went Cold also has its own PayPal account and a donate button on the website. If there's anyone out there who's feeling generous and wants to make a donation, we would greatly appreciate it, and we'll be sure to give you a shout-out on a future episode. And since we've entered a new month already, I want to provide a shout-out to all our listeners who have signed up for recurring monthly donations, and they are Alice, Amber, Don, and Casey. Remember, you have the option of signing up for regular monthly donations, or if you prefer, you can make a one-time-only donation through our website. Either way, we're very appreciative. So with all that out of the way, let us now examine the mysterious deaths of Mike Reamer and Diana Robertson. Our story begins in Washington State in 1985. Our central figures are 36-year-old Mike Reamer and his 21-year-old girlfriend Diana Robertson. The couple have been together nearly four years, and even though they are not married, they have a two-year-old daughter named Crystal. On the morning of December 12th, Mike, Diana, and Crystal hop into Mike's pickup truck and leave their home in the town of Puyallup on an excursion to find a Christmas tree. Mike makes his living as a roofer, but works as an animal trapper during the winter months to supplement his income. The family is planning to venture into the woods near the Nisqually River to find their Christmas tree, and Mike will also use this opportunity to check his traps. But what actually happened to them over the course of the next few hours has been heavily debated for the past three decades. Later that afternoon, Crystal was found wandering alone outside a Kmart in the town of Spanaway, located about 12 miles south of Puyallup. Customers eventually noticed Crystal and became concerned for her, so they brought her inside the store. When the staff made an announcement asking for the girl's parents, no one came forward. Everyone there seemed pretty surprised by Crystal's demeanor. Generally, if a child her age became separated from their parents in a public place, they'd probably be hysterical and crying. Yet Crystal remained completely silent and seemed to have a stunned look on her face. Because of her young age, she was unable to provide any answers about where her parents were, and since her guardians could not be located, she was placed in temporary foster care. It would be three days until anyone uncovered the child's identity. When Crystal's foster mother took her to a medical center to treat some minor scratches and bruises on her arms, one of the nurses recognized the child from a news broadcast which had publicized the family's disappearance. Now that she was identified, Crystal was then placed in the care of Diana's mother, but when she was asked about the whereabouts of her parents, she simply answered, Mommy is in the trees. So a search was conducted of the vast wooded areas near the Nisqually River, but no trace of Mike, Diana, or their pickup truck could be found. 
The couple would remain missing until February 18, 1986, when a shocking discovery was made on a remote logging road off of Washington State Route 7. This location was surrounded by forest and located over 30 miles south of Stanaway, situated between the small communities of Mineral and Elby. A man walking his dog came across Mike Reamer's pickup truck parked on the road and lying on the ground outside it under several inches of snow was the body of Diana Robertson. She had been stabbed 17 times and a tube sock was wrapped around her neck. There were blood stains inside the truck, but since two months of winter weather had passed, the evidence had become degraded, so forensic tests could not match the blood to a specific person. An envelope was found under the windshield with the words, I love you, Diana, written on it. Diana's family believed it was Mike's handwriting, but an FBI analysis turned out to be inconclusive. Rifle shell casings were found on the ground near the truck, but it's unclear if they were related to the crime. The strangest part was that Mike himself was nowhere to be found, and a search of the surrounding woods turned up no trace of his body, though the search was greatly hampered by a heavy snowfall. So it was a pretty puzzling situation. The mother was murdered, the father was missing, and the child was found alive outside a department store 30 miles away. So was it possible that an unknown killer had murdered the couple, and then decided to spare Crystal by driving her to a public place and dropping her off? Well actually, the police started exploring the possibility that Mike Reamer himself was the killer. You see, Mike wasn't exactly a good guy. Unfortunately, there was domestic abuse in this relationship, and Mike often beat Diana. According to Diana's mother, Diana once claimed that Mike had threatened to kill her, and bragged that he would get away with it. Just under two months before Diana's death, there was an incident where Mike broke into Diana's apartment, threw her down, and rubbed her face into the carpet. Mike was charged with domestic assault, and Diana decided to file a restraining order against him. However, Diana soon reconciled with Mike. It's possible this was because Diana was only 17 when they first got together, or maybe she was concerned that Mike would get custody of Crystal if they split up. Whatever her reasons, things did seem to be going okay for the couple right before this crime took place. Given Mike's history of violence, and the fact that he was nowhere to be found, investigators did not find it implausible that he could have gone into a fit of rage and murdered Diana after they stopped on the logging road. The writing on the envelope in the truck, I love you Diana, could have been Mike's way of expressing remorse and apologizing for what he'd done. Unfortunately, if Mike did kill Diana, it would have taken place right in front of Crystal. Maybe Mike did not want to harm his own child, but he did not want to take Crystal with him if he had to flee. So he decided to drive away from the scene, drop Crystal off at the nearest public place to ensure she would be safe, and then went on the run as a wanted fugitive. Mike was an avid outdoorsman, so he could have gone off to live in the woods somewhere and stayed off the grid. Given their first-hand knowledge of Mike's abuse, Diana's family was pretty certain that he killed her. However, there were a few things about this whole scenario which didn't make much sense. Mike's truck was found at the murder scene, so if he committed the crime, he would have had to have driven 30 miles to the Kmart, dropped Crystal off, and then driven all the way back to the logging road to abandon the truck, which isn't the most logical thing to do if you're about to go on the run for murder. That logging road was between 2-3 to three miles from the main highway, so Mike would have had to walk a great distance, and as far as I know, there were no reports of motorists picking up any hitchhikers who matched his description. An alternate scenario is that Mike decided to stay away from populated areas and just took off into the woods, but the big issue there is that Mike's coat was left behind inside the truck, and given the freezing winter temperatures, he would not have survived long without it. And there turned out to be a major complication once police learned about another unsolved crime involving a murdered couple. On August 10th, 27-year-old Stephen Harkins and his 42-year-old girlfriend Ruth Cooper left their home in Tacoma for a weekend camping trip at Tool Lake in Pierce County. They never returned home, and four days later, hikers came across a remote campsite and discovered Stephen's body inside a sleeping bag. He had been shot in the head, probably while he was sleeping. The couple had also taken their dog on the trip with them, and was soon found shot to death several hundred yards away. Ruth was nowhere to be found, and it would not be until October 26 when her skull was discovered a mile and a half from the campsite. Two days after that, the rest of Ruth's body was found about 50 feet away. I've seen differing accounts about Ruth's cause of death, but from what I gather, her body was too decomposed at this point to conclusively determine how she died. However, the most chilling detail about the crime was that much like Diana Robertson, a tube sock was tied around Ruth's neck, and in both cases, the exact same type of knot was used. This strongly suggested that both crimes were committed by the same killer, but since investigators were leaning towards the idea that Mike Reamer killed Diana, did this mean he also murdered Stephen Harkins and Ruth Cooper? Well, the couple's campsite was located only 15 miles away from where Diana was killed, and it also happened to be an area where Mike was known to leave his animal traps, so he probably would have been familiar with it. So now, Mike was not only suspected of murdering his spouse, but it was possible that he was also a full-fledged serial killer. The police did believe there was enough circumstantial evidence to point to Mike, and were ready to issue a warrant for his arrest. But the problem was that they could not uncover any concrete evidence to prove that Mike was still alive. But there wasn't even any hard evidence to prove he was dead, either. Even after the case garnered a lot of exposure on Unsolved Mysteries, there were no confirmed sightings of Mike, and the case would pretty much remain at a standstill for over 20 years. However, on March 26, 2011, a hiker was walking through a brushy wooded area located about a mile away from the original murder scene when he came across a partial skull fragment, 
which had been concealed by a discarded vacuum cleaner cover. Police were notified and conducted a search of the surrounding area, where they soon came across a human mandible which likely belonged to the owner of the skull fragment. This allowed police to check dental records, and they would confirm that both the mandible and the skull fragment belonged to Mike Reamer. Even though the rest of his body has still never been found, this discovery officially confirmed that Mike was dead. So did this clear him from being Diana's killer? Well, not necessarily. Mike's exact cause of death could not be determined, though investigators have stated that the condition of the skull fragment has allowed them to rule out the possibility that he was killed by a gunshot to the head. But it wasn't inconceivable that Mike could have murdered Diana, driven Crystal to the Kmart, returned to the murder scene, and then wandered off into the woods to commit suicide. Apparently, Mike was known for always carrying a 22 caliber handgun with him whenever he checked his traps, but no gun or any other weapon was found, and the skull fragment didn't leave any indication that he could have shot himself in the head. Investigators did find what appeared to be a driver's license, but it was too weathered to determine who it actually belonged to. There are also indications that other evidence was found, but details about it have been withheld from the public. When this story hit the media, reporters tracked down Crystal, who was now in her late 20s, but she refused to provide any comment. And really, considering what she went through, who can blame her? We have no idea if Crystal has any memory of what happened to her parents. Given her young age at the time, she probably doesn't remember anything, but if she does, she's never spoken about it publicly. Anyway, the confirmation of Mike's death was a big development in this case, and seemed to lean away from the possibility that he murdered Diana or Stephen Harkins and Ruth Cooper. But unfortunately, we still have no idea who might have actually been responsible, and both these cases continue to remain unsolved. So I guess you could say, the trail went cold. Like I said earlier, this is one of my personal favorite Unsolved Mysteries cases because there are so many different scenarios for what could have happened. I'm always intrigued by cases where someone is murdered and their spouse goes missing, leaving it ambiguous about whether they committed the crime or if they were just another innocent victim. I previously covered a case like this on my episode about Edward Maps, who became one of the FBI's 10 most wanted fugitives because he disappeared after the murder of his wife and child. To this day, Maps has never been found, and no one is completely certain if he was actually the real killer or not. But this case is particularly complicated because we have a missing spouse who had a history of violence and seemed capable of committing murder, a young child who probably witnessed the crime and does not remember it, and another double murder which seems to be connected to this one. So how do the pieces of this puzzle fit together? I think the two crimes have too many similarities not to be connected. We have two couples who died in the woods, and in both cases, the woman had a tube sock tied around her neck, and the couple's remains were found a great distance apart from each other. This part is probably nothing more than a coincidence, but I also find it eerie that there was a 15 year age difference between both couples. Now, I wouldn't read anything into the fact that Mike's skull fragment and jawbone were not found in the woods until over 25 years later. His remains were probably in that forest the entire time. Remember, they didn't even start searching this particular area until two months after he went missing, and this was during the winter months. A lot could have happened during that time, as Mike's body might have fallen victim to the elements. Wild animals could have easily spread Mike's remains throughout the forest, which is why they've only found a skull fragment and his mandible, but not the rest of them. It's perfectly plausible these remains were missed when these woods were originally searched back in 1986. I can think of countless cases where someone goes missing in the wilderness and the original search party fails to find the remains, but then they suddenly turn up in that same area years later. The episode I previously did about the disappearance and death of Don Kemp is a prime example of this. So it's very likely that Mike died in the woods on the same day as Diana. It's just a matter of determining whether he committed suicide or was murdered by an unknown third party. Well, one thing I've always had a hard time believing is Mike being responsible for the murders of Stephen Harkins and Ruth Cooper. I know the guy was a domestic abuser, which is pretty bad, so there's good reason to think he was capable of killing Diana. But just because the guy beat his spouse does not necessarily mean he was a serial killer who murdered random strangers. Now, one reason they didn't find it implausible that Mike committed the Harkins-Cooper murders is because they were camping in an area where he was known to leave his traps. And since Mike always carried a gun with him when he checked his traps, maybe he crossed paths with a couple, something escalated, and he just snapped and killed both of them. But personally, I think the flaw in that logic is that Mike chose to do his trapping during the winter months because the roofing business was slow in the winter, and he needed the trapping to supplement his income. Stephen and Ruth, they were killed in August, and I'm just not sure if Mike would be out checking traps in that area during the summer. So I don't see what Mike's motive would be to follow two complete strangers into the woods to murder them. However, one possible theory is that Mike could have read about these murders in the news and used them as an inspiration when he killed Diana. He might have decided that if he wrapped a tube sock around Diana's neck, investigators would automatically assume that the same person who murdered Stephen and Ruth was responsible. But the problem with this theory is that I get the impression that the detail about the tube sock around Ruth's neck was not disclosed publicly, so Mike probably wouldn't have known about it. And this theory would only make sense if Mike had gone on the run and wanted to give off the false impression that a serial killer murdered both him and Diana. But since his remains were found in the woods only a mile away from the murder scene, this strongly suggests that Mike committed suicide if he was guilty. And I don't see the point of attempting to pin your crime on a serial killer if you're just going to kill yourself. A gunshot wound to the head has been ruled out as a possible cause of death for Mike, and since that's the most likely method he would have used to take his own life, I'm just not getting the impression that he committed suicide. One piece of evidence which gave off the impression that Mike might have committed the murder 
was the envelope found in the truck which had I Love You Diana written on it, as it was theorized that Mike wrote that out of remorse for what he did. It's always been unclear to me if there was anything else inside that envelope, or if investigators chose to withhold that detail from the public. But either way, I'm inclined to believe that envelope is nothing more than a red herring. Remember, this is only a few weeks removed from Mike being charged with domestic assault and having a restraining order filed against him by Diana. Yet they managed to reconcile, and Diana got back together with him. So I personally think that Mike wrote that message at another time and gave the envelope to Diana in an attempt to mend the relationship. For all we know, that envelope could have been sitting on the dashboard for days, even weeks. But since it happened to be displayed so prominently when Diana was found murdered next to the truck, it suddenly took on a whole new sinister meaning. Another reason people believe that Mike was the killer is the fact that Crystal was found at the Kmart 30 miles away. That is easily the most baffling detail about this entire case. If Mike snapped and killed Diana and came to the decision to commit suicide, he might have realized that he needed to get his daughter to a public place so that she'd be safe. This logging road was in the middle of nowhere, so if Crystal was stranded out there alone, then there's no way she would have survived. On the surface, it seems far more likely that a concerned father would drive 30 miles to drop off Crystal rather than some random killer. But I don't know about that. When you look at the circumstances, Mike really wouldn't have been doing his daughter any favors just ditching her like that. The girl had to stand around alone outside the Kmart for who knows how long before anyone helped her, and there was a risk that someone with sinister intentions could have picked the girl up and did her harm. Crystal was far too young to tell anyone who she was or what happened to her, and that is why she had to be placed in foster care for three days before anyone figured out who she was. If Mike was really that concerned about Crystal's welfare, then he could have either dropped her off with a family member or a friend, or at least gone to a payphone and called someone to let them know Crystal was at the Kmart. And one reason I don't believe that Crystal was dropped off by Mike is the fact that she was so silent and appeared to have a stunned look on her face. You know how kids are. If her father just abandoned her in an unfamiliar place, that's probably going to be a very scary thing for Crystal, and she'd probably start crying and throw a fit. But as far as anyone can tell, that never happened the entire time she was there. However, if Crystal had recently witnessed a traumatic event and was abandoned at the store by a stranger she didn't even know, then her reaction is probably going to be more subdued. Now, you may wonder why someone who was capable of murdering Crystal's parents would go to the trouble of ensuring she was safe. But even serial killers can have their own moral codes, and some of them would draw the line at harming a two-year-old child. Just to use another Unsolved Mysteries case as an example, there's the story about the infamous tri-state murder spree where two teenagers from Gainesville, Texas traveled through three different states and murdered four people over the course of one day. This was one of the most senseless crimes ever profiled on Unsolved Mysteries, and the two perpetrators were sadistic animals, yet they still drew the line at harming a child. The first murder involved breaking into a woman's trailer and brutally stabbing her to death, but they left her infant son unharmed. If those two psychos could spare a child, then I don't find it implausible that Mike and Diana's killer would do the same thing. This person probably wanted to ensure that Crystal would survive and decided that the best course of action was to leave her at a public place where she could get help. But of course, they didn't want to be seen by anyone and potentially get caught, so they dropped Crystal off without sticking around to make sure she was safe. If Mike had planned to disappear and give off the false impression that he had been killed too, then yes, I could also see him casually dropping Crystal off and avoiding contact with anyone. But his remains were eventually found back at the murder scene, so he clearly did not go on the run. Now, like I said earlier, Crystal refused to give interviews and speak publicly once her father was confirmed to be dead, and that's definitely her right. At this point, who knows what she remembers about that day. When she said her line, Mommy is in the trees, she was probably referring to the fact that she last saw her mother in the woods, but it's unclear what event she actually witnessed. It's interesting that she was taken to a medical center three days after she was found because of minor scratches and bruises on her arms, but I'm not entirely sure if she got those before she was found at the Kmart, or if they're related to what happened in the woods. Crystal was raised by Diana's mother, who believed that Mike was the killer, so she might not have grown up with the most favorable impression of her father. Whatever the truth, I hope she's doing okay today. So I think I pretty much established that I don't believe Mike killed Diana, and that it's far more likely they were both murdered by an unknown third party. The parallels between this crime and the Harkins Cooper murders are interesting, because in that case, the man was murdered at the scene, and it seems likely that the woman was abducted and murdered at another location. But the Reamer Robertson murder suggests the opposite, as Diana was murdered outside the truck, while Mike's remains were found at another location. By the time the skull fragment and the mandible were found, so much time had passed that it was impossible to determine if the killer made an attempt to bury or conceal Mike's body. The skull fragment was found underneath a vacuum cleaner cover, but I have no idea if that was in the woods the whole time. It would be strange if the killer went to the trouble of hiding Mike's body but left Diana's body out in the open. I think it's possible that Mike went into the woods alone to either find a Christmas tree or check his traps. He left his coat behind in the truck, and Diana remained there too. When the killer arrived, the couple were murdered separately at different locations. If that scenario is correct, then obviously the big question is, who actually committed these murders? Well before we continue on with this case, let's talk about Stephen Harkins and Ruth Cooper. Their case hasn't received as much attention as the Reamer-Robertson murders, and not much is really known about the victims, but there is one intriguing lead. 
Before his death, Stephen was reportedly involved in a dispute with a man who did damage to his motorcycle. On the same day they went to Lake Tool for their camping trip, Stephen and Ruth first stopped off at a wedding reception. After the couple left, the man involved in the dispute showed up at the reception and he was apparently anxious to confront Stephen. So the obvious theory is that this man found out where Stephen and Ruth were camping, followed them into the woods, and murdered them both. I don't know any details about this man, as his identity has never been released publicly, but it doesn't look like the police found any evidence to tie him to the murders. Even so, if the guy had a grudge against Stephen, I don't know what motive he'd have to murder Mike and Diana four months later, so I have no idea if he has any significance to this case. Now, it must be said that Washington State, and the Northwest in general, seemed to be a hotspot for serial killers during the 1980s and early 1990s. The most famous example is probably Gary Ridgway, the notorious Green River Killer, but there are many others. So let's see if any of them might be potential suspects in these crimes. In March of 1985, a couple named Edward Smith and Kimberly Diane Levine were murdered in Grant County, which is located over three hours away from the locations of the tube sock killings. Once again, the body of the male victim was discovered first, and the remains of the female victim were found four months later, just under two miles away from her spouse. Even though there was no tube sock used in this crime, investigators did initially wonder if it was connected to the Harkins Cooper murders. Four years later, fingerprint evidence was matched to a truck driver named Billy Ray Ballard, who was serving time in a Wyoming prison for the murders of two women. He subsequently pled guilty to the Smith-Levine murders and received a life sentence, but no evidence has ever connected him to the tube sock killings. Interestingly enough, Unsolved Mysteries also did a segment about the 1987 murders of a young Canadian couple named Jay Cook and Tanya von Kylenborg, who were killed after crossing the border from British Columbia for a trip to Seattle. Their bodies were found 90 miles apart, and the case remains unsolved. Once again, there's no evidence to suggest this crime was connected to the tube sock killings, but it seems like there were an awful lot of cases in Washington State during this time period where a couple was murdered and their bodies were found in separate locations. Well, the suspect whose name has come up most frequently in relation to these crimes is a drifter named Joseph Henry Burgess. Officially, Burgess has always been the prime suspect in the 1972 killings of a couple named Leif Bertel Carlson and Barbara Durand, who were both shot to death while camping at Radar Beach on Vancouver Island. Years earlier, Burgess had crossed the border into Canada to avoid being drafted for the Vietnam War, and he lived at a separate campsite on that same beach. He disappeared immediately after the murders and left behind all his possessions, except for his rifle. Now, being a drifter, no one can be sure of Burgess's exact movements over the course of the next three decades, but he would eventually gain notoriety in New Mexico and earn the nickname the Cookie Bandit. This was because Burgess had a habit of breaking into rural cabins to steal food and other items he needed to survive outdoors, and apparently some of these stolen items included cookies. Well, in July of 2009, Burgess happened to break into a cabin he had already robbed before, so two police officers were there staking the place out. They wound up getting into a struggle which ended with Burgess fatally shooting one of the officers before he was shot dead himself. Well, afterward, the authorities ran Burgess's fingerprints and discovered that it matched fingerprints found on evidence from the Radar Beach murders in 1972. Burgess has been considered a suspect in at least one other murder, but none have been conclusively tied to him. Now, like I said earlier, Burgess was a drifter and his whereabouts were unknown for decades, so who knows if he would have been in Washington State in 1985 when the tube sock killings took place. But the thing which makes him an interesting suspect here is that shortly before the murders of Carlson and Durant, Burgess was heard complaining about how he hated the idea of an unmarried Christian couple sleeping together on the beach. Burgess was a fanatical religious zealot who believed he was on a mission from God, and he apparently had a major problem with premarital sex, which is the most likely motive for the Radar Beach murders. What's interesting here is that the two couples murdered in the tube sock killings were also unmarried. Ruth Cooper was actually a single mother who had multiple children from her previous relationship before she hooked up with Stephen Harkins, who was 15 years younger than her. And of course, Mike Reamer and Diana Robertson had a child together even though they never got married. Given his fanatical religious views, maybe Burgess decided that both couples deserved to be killed, but felt that an innocent child like Crystal deserved to be spared. Of course, there are some issues with this theory. Assuming Burgess's motive here was his hatred of unmarried couples, how would he even know these couples were unmarried? I mean, this was a known survivalist who presumably spent most of his time living in the wilderness, so I'm not sure how he would have known anything about each couple's personal life unless he crossed paths with them in the woods and flat out asked them if they were married. While the Harkins Cooper murders have enough similarities with the Vancouver Island killing to think they might be connected, the major problem with tying Burgess to the Reamer Robertson murders is Crystal. Being a career drifter, I'm not sure that Burgess would have had access to a vehicle to drive Crystal to the Kmart. I don't think that Mike's truck would have been used to drop Crystal off because there was blood all over the interior, and I don't think she got any blood on her and I don't see why Burgess would steal Mike's truck, drive 30 miles to Stanaway, and then drive the 30 miles back to the murder scene to abandon it. It seems more likely that the killer would have dropped Crystal off with her own vehicle, and I'm not sure if Burgess had access to one. Of course, Burgess could have stolen a vehicle somewhere, but we have no way of knowing his whereabouts in 1985, so until conclusive evidence places him in Washington during this time period, he'll be nothing more than a tenuous suspect. Now, I do think it's possible that some psycho could have just stumbled upon Harkins and Cooper while they were camping in the woods and decided to kill them but the odds of Mike, Diana, and Crystal driving out onto a remote logging road 
and just randomly crossing paths with a psycho would have to be astronomical. This road was so out of the way that it was two whole months before anyone else went there and discovered the truck, so I have to wonder if someone was stalking them that day and decided to follow them to that particular location to commit the murders. I can't completely discount the possibility that Mike and Diana were killed with someone they knew who had a personal grudge against them and didn't actually commit the Harkins Cooper murders. They might have decided to conceal Mike's body to give off the impression that he murdered Diana, which people would have no trouble believing given his documented history of violence. Or, this person could have heard about the previous murders in the news and decided to wrap the tube sock around Diana's neck to make it look like she was murdered by a serial killer. But again, I'm not entirely sure if the detail about the tube sock was released publicly, and if it wasn't, then that would rule out a copycat and indicate that both crimes were committed by the same person. I have a feeling that the killer saw Mike and Diana somewhere else earlier that day, became fixated on them, and then followed them onto the logging road to kill them. I can't be 100% certain, but I think that Mike did stop at other locations to check his traps before he went to the murder site, so this might be where the killer originally spotted them. When they parked the truck on the logging road, Mike could have walked into the woods to either find a Christmas tree or check some traps while Diana remained behind. The killer then arrived and stabbed Diana before walking into the forest, finding Mike, and murdering him too. Crystal was probably present for the murder of at least one, if not both, of her parents, but being only two years old, she probably didn't have a full understanding of what was happening. Whatever happened, the killer did not want to harm Crystal, so she was driven to the Kmart and dropped off at the entrance before the perpetrator disappeared. If there's a best-case scenario for how this turned out, maybe the person who was responsible for all four of these murders soon got themselves arrested for an unrelated crime and went to prison. Or maybe they died before they got the opportunity to harm anyone else. There would be no more known murders where a victim had a tube sock tied around their neck, and this is such a distinct detail that on the surface, it seems like the perpetrator never killed again. But then again, maybe the killer just decided to change their M.O. because they left a living witness this time. While I can understand the reasoning for doing so, it is kind of a shame that the investigation focused so much on Mike Reamer being the killer. I don't think this would have happened if he didn't have such a history of domestic violence, but I think the discovery of his skull fragment and his mandible pretty much exonerates him. Mike may have been a terrible abusive spouse, but I don't think he was a murderer. Sadly, I think that the real killer of both these couples has gotten away with it, and could conceivably still be out there. So if you have any information about the deaths of Mike Reamer and Diana Robertson, or the murders of Stephen Harkins and Ruth Cooper, please contact the appropriate authorities. But if you just have your own personal theory about what happened, I'd love to hear from you. Feel free to leave me a comment or send me an email at robin.warder at icloud.com. That's robin.warder at icloud.com. I want to thank all my loyal listeners and supporters out there, especially those from the Unsolved Mysteries message board at the Sitcoms Online Forum and the Unresolved Mysteries subreddit. A big thank you to Miguel Foote, who edits and assembles this podcast together for me. And of course, a big shout out to Vince Nitro, who composes the eerie music you hear on every episode. If you haven't already, you can like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, or leave us a rating or review on iTunes, Stitcher, or Google Play Music. And like I mentioned earlier, we also have a donate button on our website. So if you're feeling generous and want to express your appreciation for all the hard work we've put into this podcast, we'd be extremely grateful. So have yourself a good week, and join me next time for a brand new minisode of The Trail Went Cold. Thank <laughs> you.